second warning at this point. Also, welcome to everybody who's joining us live on the live stream. In the email that had the link, there was also a source sheet. So everybody here in the room, please make sure you have a source sheet and uh, everybody who's following along at home. You're not hearing? Okay. Is it on? On? Hello? Sean? One second. Is it on? A little I'm sure. Okay. Anyway, I speak pretty loudly, but if you don't hear me, let me know. I basically got this job because of my, my voice. <laughs> Two people here got a job because of their voice, Cantor Helfgott and me. Okay, does everybody have uh, does everybody have a source sheet? Okay, it's crucial that you have your source sheet because uh, we rely on the sources. That's the way we learn here. So um, welcome. I hope you're enjoying. It's odd to say to be enjoying because it's the nine days, it's the saddest time in our calendar, and yet we're overcoming the nine days. Uh, the way to overcome the nine days is to do mitzvahs, to learn Torah. And that's what we're doing. Um, and that's the way to fight the darkness through light. And actually, everybody's already doing a mitzvah because the meal tonight is a sudan mitzvah. Uh, that's why we could eat meat uh, because Rabbi Einstein made a beautiful siyum. And those who are at home, you're going to have to figure out your, uh, your eating. You're on your own. Uh, but everybody here is doing a mitzvah, but now everybody joining from home is also doing a mitzvah is going to learn Torah together. Okay, what I want to talk about, what I want to talk about tonight is two ba'av. Does everybody hear me fine? Okay. Um, I want to talk about two ba'av, which is the 15th of Av. We're not even at the 9th of Av. But after the ninth of Av, the famous Tisha B'Av fast is the 15th of Av. And that's a special day on our calendar. Why? Any thoughts? Why is it a special day, the 15th of Av? It used to be called Sadie. It's the ancient Sadie Hawkins Day. Okay, very good. If you look in your source sheets, the very last source. My dad also brought up Sadie Hawkins when I was telling him what I'm speaking about. Um, I'm very honored that my father, Dr. Leopold Plato, is here with us. Um, so uh, in the last page, the very last source, now you see we completed the source sheet, uh, Sadie Hawkins Day, the cartoon from the 1930s. So um, I'm not going to take a poll who's here been at a Sadie Hawkins dance. Okay, I don't know if anybody's been, but you're welcome uh, at some point in privacy to share a story. I'm curious to learn a little bit more that that cultural artifact from uh, American life um, in the 1930s, just Sadie Hawkins Day, for those who don't know, based on a cartoon and the idea of a, uh, a, a, uh, a should have problem, which continues to be a challenge to this day. People have a hard time finding their best shirt and uh, is the uh, father of a daughter. He's nervous that she'd become, uh, you know, she would not get married. And he found this way to um sort of have a dance if i got it right and she could whoever she could grab she could snatch um that would be 
her uh, her future mate. So this idea actually does have some relationship to the holiday of Tuba Av. Um, so uh, any uh, the truth is in Israel sometimes they refer to Tuba Av. If you haven't heard of Tuba Av, you're fine. Okay. You're actually doing better than those who've heard of it. Because if you've heard of it, you might be a little confused. If you haven't heard of it, great. But in Israel, sometimes they call Tuba Av Yom Ava, the day of love. Um, a type of Valentine's Day. So it's a Valentine's Day, a Sadie Hawkins Day, because maybe you actually do more than just wait for your Valentine. You go find your Valentine. So all of these are ideas that are associated with Tuba Av. Um, I want to... You go through some sources, a lot of sources here, but we'll walk through in our way. Um, we will curate the sources and pick and choose and try to highlight some basic themes. But it's a detective story we're after tonight. What is Tuba Av all about, the 15th of Av? And as we'll see, the sources uh, themselves are intriguing and maybe raise even more questions. And at the end, aside from learning a fair amount of sources, uh, if you're confused at all, it's not because of the presentation, no doubt, but rather because the sources themselves will leave us with some trailing questions. So things to think about uh, for the next week or so. Uh, so I want to start on page one, source one, and this is from the Mishnah in Ta'anit, Tractate Ta'anit, and the very end of Tractate Ta'anit has the following Mishnah. It's in the middle of page one in Hebrew and the underlines, or at the end of page one in the English and the underlines. Um, maybe I'll just read the English here. Rav Shimon ben Gamliel said, there were no days of joy in Israel greater than the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. What a startling Mishnah already, right? A real head scratcher. The greatest days, in, the most joyous days of Israel were the 15th of Av, which all of us are not exactly sure what happened and what we're doing, but that apparently is especially joyous. And also Yom Kippur, now, if you said the most holy day, maybe the most famous day, the most uh, observed day, but the most joyous day, that's very fascinating. So we're going to leave Yom Kippur on the side. That you have, you know, a couple of months to think about and get back to me. What do you think is going on over there? Um, so... The source continues, on these days, the daughters of Jerusalem would go out in borrowed white garments in order not to shame anyone who had none. All these garments required immersion, and the daughters of Jerusalem came out and danced in the vineyards. So you'd wear white, it's a special day here in uh, Parky Synagogue, we take our... Uh, sartorial, uh, uh, our, our dress, we take seriously. Um, so here, too, in the Mishnah, we have a source. So on this holiday, you have to wear white. That actually resonates with Yom Kippur. There's a practice to wear white on Yom Kippur, but apparently on Tubab also. The women wore white, white dresses, and there's this idea of everybody being on the same standard, so they would borrow it, everybody in the same, um, just like we know there are certain schools who have a set outfit, a set uniform here. Everybody wore white, and they would go out to the vineyards, and they would dance, and the idea seems to be that they would go out and dance, and the continuation, which I have here in the Hebrew, is that they would start up with the opposite sex, and they would uh, sort of invite uh, suitors. And, uh, and there's a very interesting continuation in the Mishnah of uh, what one should be looking for in a shidduch, which I'm not going to get into the details now, but important advice here in the continuation of the mission, which I didn't translate because I was a little short on space. So here from the Mishnah, let's just pause what we have right now. Apparently, this is a very joyous day, the 15th of Av, especially joyous. And there's this practice, apparently, to dress in white for women to go out into the vineyards to dance especially in Jerusalem, apparently, and to uh, invite suitors and to lead to a shidduch, lead to a marriage. So this explains some of the associations that some people had. Love Day, Valentine's Day, Sadie Hawkins Day, because even literally a type of amazing, right? This is a, 
a couple of thousand years before Sadie Hawkins Day, but the idea of a dance and that one snatches one's uh, or sort of uh, initiates um, with uh, uh, one's uh, potential suitor and hopefully it leads to a match. Now, this is somewhat reminiscent of a biblical story. Does anybody know what biblical story could help us? What biblical story? Go for it, Nisan. What biblical story? Okay. Uh, some reminiscence of Ruth, but there's actually a difficult biblical story in the book of Judges. At the very end of the book of Judges, I'll just say this quickly, but look it up. Actually, a pretty terrible story um, called Pelegish Begiva, uh, the concubine from Giva, where there's this horrific um, rape and massacre. Very, very, uh, some of the most difficult chapters to read in the Bible at the end of the book of Judges. But that leads to civil war. So it spirals out of control, the book of Judges. I'm just describing this outside. And at the very end, there's one tribe that's the culprit, that's Benjamin, because Benjamin uh, was behind the atrocity. And uh, all the tribes declare war on Benjamin, and they double down on the war. It's a very you know, terrible story in the Bible for a few reasons now. And they say, we will not marry anybody from the tribe of Benjamin. So Benjamin is being, their fate is to go into, you know, to fade into oblivion, because they won't have continuity. And then at the very end of the book of Judges, they realize this is very harsh and they have to find a workaround to enable the tribe of Benjamin back into the tribes of Israel. And one of the things they tap into, very interesting verses, is that they say that in Shiloh, which is where the temple, the tabernacle was, that there was an ancient holiday. So the Bible itself alludes to an ancient holiday. And on this holiday, women would dance in the vineyards, and the Benjamin tribes should go find prospective mates from other tribes that way. That's sort of a workaround, this ban on marrying. That's a story at the end of the book of Judges. If you get a chance, you should look at it. So obviously, uh, I, and yeah, it's a, it's a difficult story, but... Um, Obviously, this Mishnah is very reminiscent of that story. Because the Mishnah says, on this day, women dance in the vineyards and meet their mates. And if you open up the book of Judges, chapter 21, you'll see there was an ancient holiday that was indeed celebrated at the end of the book of Judges, where uh, women went out to the vineyards, danced, and met mates from the tribe of Benjamin. So that's sort of lurking in the background. Now, is there any other hint here in the Mishnah about, maybe there's a few hints, but I want to pause to think about one other hint about the 15th of Av, at least possibly, or maybe a couple of related hints from a different variety. The date, the date, well into, think of where we are now, getting into August, right? 15th of Av, obviously, the calendar could change a bit from year to year, but it's well into late summer. And that makes us wonder whether there's something about seasonally about where we are. Like what? Maybe the days start to get a bit shorter. So a type of like summer solstice where there's a turning point. And we know that in a lot of cultures and societies, if we did anthropological studies, there's often celebrations at turnings of seasons, or even, you know, uh, shifting points within seasons. So that might be of significance. The other hint I would suggest to think about is the vineyard, women going out to the vineyard, because that might suggest a certain agricultural theme, celebration within the vineyard. Maybe this is a time of harvest, of grapes. And indeed, that seems to work out. I actually did a, just a little poking around. And if you see in ancient Israel, according to studies, this is around the time of the harvest of the grapes, usually. So maybe, like we know, a lot of Jewish holidays have historical dimensions and also agricultural dimensions, and sometimes maybe even 
seasonal. Maybe we don't put as uh, much focus on that, but even um, that too. Like Hanukkah, people point out Hanukkah is when the days start to get, you know, the shortest and start to get longer. So here maybe it's the sort of opposite. So there are a few different things to think about. But we're not really sure what this day is all about. We have some hints. Maybe it's associated with shidduchs. Maybe it's associated with this biblical allusion to an ancient holiday. It seems to have some link maybe to temple, Jerusalem, Shiloh. Maybe it has some link to the time of year where the days start to get shorter. Maybe it has some link to the vineyards and to the harvest. We have a lot of maybes. Let's look at what the Talmud says. Now, when you turn to page two, is everybody with me on the sources? At home, too. Okay, good. We got a yes for at home. I like it. So, on page two, we have. Source three, the Babylonian Talmud. And it's actually a, uh, a bit of an intricate, that might be of a turnoff, but a bit of an elaborate Talmudic passage. But the thrust of the Talmudic passage is no fewer than six explanations for Tubab, for the 15th of Av. In the Jerusalem Talmud, which I'll just hint at later, there are five. In the Babylonian Talmud, six explanations, which makes me think, once you have six explanations, I'm sorry to say something a little irreverent, it sort of makes me think that the ancient rabbis of Babylon and Jerusalem also weren't exactly sure what this holiday is about. And they had multiple explanations, but in a more sort of traditional way to formulate it, I think there's actually a sort of a more positive spin that we know that some of the richness of our tradition is that layers accrue. And maybe indeed over time, this holiday start to signify different things. So I want us to think about all of those loose sort of comments, um, keep that in the back of our mind, but let's go through the list briefly. And we can't get in too deep in the list. But let's go through them briefly. So I'm not going to read everything. Let's just read the opening line here, page two. I'll read in the English. What happened on the 15th of Av? And um, let, let's skip to number two for a second. What's number two? The tribe of Benjamin, which we all know that, right? Because we just reviewed that. Judges 21, there was a civil war against the tribe of Benjamin. And there was a ban against marrying Benjamin. And the way the workaround was to take advantage of a holiday. And that was what happened. So either that marked the holiday or it's continuing that holiday associated with that story. That's answer two. Now let's go back to answer one. Answer one, I'll just describe these outside. Permission granted to, for the tribes to intermarry. What's that alluding to? Just very briefly, this has to do with our Torah readings recently from the end of Bamibar, the end of the Book of Numbers, where we read the fascinating story about the daughters of Tzlofchad, who complain that they won't get a tribal inheritance. And indeed, Moses brings us to God, who says, indeed, they should inherit. But the problem is, okay, great, they'll inherit in lieu of their father who passed on. But once they inherit and then they marry, it's going to transfer to the, uh, the husband's estate over time. And if the husband comes from a different tribe, then we're back in the same fix. So the very end of the book of Numbers, Bamibar deals with this and says, that the daughters of self God should marry within their tribe, should marry only members of their tribe, Menashe. So there again, there is a, with a, a, a sort of a closing in of tribes. And they say, well, that was then, but that was uh, suspended over time, revoked, that limit. You know, it's going forward. If you're from Menashe, you can marry. If you fall in love with Zulun, go for it. Okay. Go have a, a great romance with Mr. Zvulun, Miss Menasha. And uh, 
that's interesting. I'll already just make a comment. One almost wonders whether this is sort of taking the theme of Benjamin being on the side and sort of being invited back into the tribes and finding antecedents to this within the Torah. There we get that suggestion. It's a little subtle, but I think it makes some sense. Now, it's from the Mishnah. There's an allusion to the story with the Benjamin tribe because it's dancing in the vineyards. And that really touches on the theme of tribal isolation versus tribal integration. And that actually has an antecedent in Bamibar in the story of the daughters of Tzavchad who were isolationists for a period. And then the, the, the footnote is, the addendum is, that was just for their times, but over time we integrate. And, and the, the plots will work themselves out, but we should view ourselves as one nation with 12 tribes who we marry one another. Okay? We know there's enough challenges with Shadduchim. We don't need to look at what tribe are you from. That would not be good for us. Okay? We're a tribal enough. Uh, members, right? MOT, members of the tribe, but you can't be members of a sub-tribe. Okay. Then we have answer three. What's answer three? Answer three talks about the continues within Bamibar, continues within the book of Numbers that we read, but it refers to the death of that generation that left Egypt, and they died after the sin of the spies, the Chet HaMeraglim. It was in, uh, God swore that they will die off in the desert. So what's there to celebrate? The celebration is the end of the cessation. I mean, it's obviously tragic because the generation has passed away, but finally moving beyond that extended period of death, finally in the 40th year, enough, enough with, you know, mourning, let's celebrate. So that's the third explanation. Tu Ba'av is emerging from that period of death and being able to focus on life. Fourth explanation is, seems rather obscure. Fourth explanation is referring again to a biblical episode. I'll just say this briefly. A late king of Israel named Hosea, according to answer four, suspended a problematic decree of an earlier king, Yeravam. The earlier king of Yeravam, let me just say this outside for a second, briefly. If you study the book of Kings, you'll see that after David and Shlomo, after that, there's a schism. And there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. So again, similar themes here of schisms within the tribes. So thematically, there's a certain continuity here. And... The schism is reified, it's reinforced when the northern kingdom builds an alternate temple and actually bans people from going to the Jerusalem temple. So that is, you know, very harmful to the Jerusalem temple, of course, because there was guards on the road who wouldn't let people go south to Jerusalem. Instead, were redirected to go to the competing northern kingdom. According to source four, there was a later Israelite king who suspended those guards and said, whoever wants to go to the Jerusalem temple can go to the Jerusalem temple. And that's the celebration. Source, you sort of wonder, where does that come from? On the assumption that there's not some tradition. And I have a certain guess uh, let me just say it now because I'm not sure I'll get to it, but I don't want to confuse so much. You'll have to look later on your own. But there's a source here on page four. It's better not to peek even, but you can look later on source four, an earlier source that mentions Yeravam and actually mentions something about guards. So there's an earlier source that might have sort of inspired this later idea. Okay, fifth explanation. Don't worry, I know it's a lot, so I'm going to review. Fifth explanation is. Uh, again, coming out from a very tragic affair, but emerging with a positive silver lining. The tragic affair was the destruction of the city of Betar. This is um, after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, 
around the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt. So we're talking about in the second century CE, there was a massive defeat and crushing of the city of Betar. According to the Talmudic description, this was a horrific um, loss of life where this, the Romans defeated Bar Kokhba and crushed this town of Betar. And what's to celebrate? That at least there was a dignified burial of those who were killed in Betar. Although, of course, there's something very hard here, but very Jewish, that we still find ways to insist on dignity and paying last respects and even celebrating and being grateful for when we can do that. And no doubt everybody here knows that we live in a, you know, a generation that we remember well from you know, just a generation ago where that wasn't always possible. So there's that as, as you know, intense as that is, that's a, something to celebrate. And then the sixth explanation is a very different explanation. It is the last day where they chopped wood for the temple altar. The last day to chop wood for the temple altar. Why? The Talmud continues to explain that the wood would start to get moist after the 15th of Av. And once it got moist, it would start to rot and spoil, and it wasn't good firewood. In the altar in the temple, you needed firewood, and the wood started to spoil. So let me review what we've done so far. We're trying to figure out what is the 15th of Av. It's after Tisha B'Av, several days. And we don't even know what it is. It's, the truth is, let's be honest, we don't do that much to market nowadays. But if you open up rabbinic sources, the Mishnah, it says it's the greatest day up there with Yom Kippur. So apparently, at least the ideas behind it or the history behind it is something big. So minimally, it's worth digging in and trying to study a little more about this day. But it is a bit mysterious. You look in the Mishnah and it compares it to Yom Kippur, and it talks about women dancing in the fields, and it seems to allude to various themes, love, vineyards, etc. Then you go to the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud has six different explanations, which on the one hand makes you wonder, do they really know what's about? But on the other hand, they're interesting in their own right. So what are the six explanations? Just very briefly, the first one again was an allowance for women to marry in their couples to come intertribal cup marriage. Okay. Second, related, Benjamin was invited back into the fold of the tribes to marry within the tribes. Third explanation, it's when the desert generation that uh, came out of Egypt uh, all passed away. That's tragic, but at least moving on from that darkness no more darkness focus on the next generation going into the land of Israel, etc. Fourth explanation, it's going back to the Bible and it's revoking a very problematic competition between northern and southern kingdom where the northern kingdom obstructed access to the Jerusalem temple. And that was repealed by a later king said you could travel the roads and you could go to Jerusalem. Fifth explanation is that in the Bar Kokhba revolt, there was this great tragedy in Betar, but at least they brought all the bodies to dignified burial, and that's celebrated. And sixth explanation, something totally different, firewood. It was the last day to collect the firewood for the altar. If we had to take a stab at it and take a guess, of these six explanations, which one might be the best explanation, the most original explanation, sort of, you know, not just a homily, but rooted in sources? Anybody want to take a guess? Number three. Okay, do you want to explain why? Because it goes back to the Torah. I like it. Okay, and number one goes back to the Torah. But this even earlier in the Torah. Okay, I like it. Any other suggestions? Which one? The Tzolka Daughters. Okay, also quite early. I'm going to take a guess, as somebody wants to say, it was sort of alluding to the Sadie Orkins. That resonates most with the Benjamin 
that story, which actually refers to a celebration and refers to the vineyards, right? And yet, I'm going to argue now that the best explanation is the one that maybe speaks to us least. Number six, the firewood. The firewood. Okay, the firewood. What <laughs> about the firewood? So let me go with that for a little bit, and then I want to hear the comment. So again, what's number six now? If you were spacing out by number six now, this one you have to pay attention. Number six is that on this day was the last day when they would collect firewood. They collect wood, trees, to bring to the temple, to kindle the fire, the flame, and the altar. The altar, we know, needs firewood. I brought this for a second if you want to look on, or I'll just sit outside. You can, if you want to look quickly, take a peek. Page four, short six on the top. It talks about just how you needed wood for the flame for the altar. That's intuitive, but it's a verse in Vayikra. It's a verse in Leviticus. And, uh, and it says, Eishal Mizbech to Kadbolo to Feo Bier Aleo Kohen Eitzim, Baboker Baboker, Barach Aleo Olavi Tir Aleo Chavei Shlamim. Eishtami to Kadam Mizbech Lo Tichbeth. So there's a daily process of making sure there's firewood. That's an important part of, a bit maybe technical to us, of the daily cult. The daily cult is there's an altar where you're going to bring sacrifices and you need a flame. And the Torah actually spells out that you have to bring wood day by day. Okay, so that's what the sixth explanation alludes to. The sixth explanation was to say that was the last day that they collected the firewood. And again, why didn't they collect afterwards? According to the Kedirish and Talmud, the firewood just was spoiled and wasn't good afterwards. So it was, you know, it wasn't the best call you could buy. Um, now, just to show you one thing interesting, if you turn to page three, sorry, we're hopping around a little bit, but still worth peeking for a second. Page three, I hardly translate on the top, but even so, you notice something interesting. What page three is, is the parallel earlier discussion in the Jerusalem Talmud. And in the parallel earlier discussion in the Jerusalem Talmud about what is Tuba Ab all about, it gives five out of the six explanations. But what will you notice even the way I just put it? I put that it starts with the sixth explanation, then the fourth, then the first, then the second, then the third. Meaning in the Jerusalem Talmud, the order is different. Which in a way, I think, show, uh, probably suggests that there isn't such a fixed tradition. It's not starting with the Torah and God building, etc. But the other thing I want to highlight is what comes first in the Jerusalem Talmud. Explanation six, the wood. So in the earlier Jerusalem Talmud, actually the first explanation they give is the wood. And in a way, if we have to choose between the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, we love all of it. But if we have to choose, in this type of an issue, I'd be a little partial to the Jerusalem Talmud. The reason being that the Jerusalem Talmud usually reflects somewhat earlier traditions. The Babylonian Talmud is a bit later. For another lecture, we could get into some of that. It's actually interesting stuff. So the Jerusalem Talmud is a bit of an earlier source and who are trying to reconstruct what a holiday is about. So the Jerusalem Talmud, its first guess, I think, is worth, you know, putting an asterisk and saying the wood. The wood might be important. So what's going on with the wood? Let's learn a little bit more about the wood and why it might be a big deal. Um, and then we'll return to the Babylonian Talmud. So I'm back on page one. But just to make sure everybody's with me, we're trying to figure out what is the 15th of Av all about? To Bob, and here we have a new candidate, or a candidate, a dark horse candidate. It's about the wood for the altar. Why should that be important, or do we see any hints that that's important or worth celebrating? So if you look back on page one, that's the Mishnah that talked to us about Tuba'av, about the 15th of Av. That 
Mishnah has earlier Mishnayot. And the earlier Mishnayot, in other words, I'm saying, let's look back at the passage that mentions Tubab and let's see it in context. And we'll notice something interesting. If you look in Mishnah 4 already, it refers to wood offering. And it's pretty clear if we take more time that there is a celebration there. We'll see this borne out more in other sources. Then Mishnah 5. Everybody with me on page 1, looking at 4, it mentions wood offering. Mishnah 5. Mishnah 5 is a very sort of, uh, it's an interesting, unusual Mishnah, Mishnah 5. It talks about the time of the wood of the priest. Zman, right? How does it go? Zman atzeikonim va'am. The time of the wood of the priests and the people. And it talks about nine different dates where the priests and the people would bring wood to the temple. And now it starts to list dates and families. On the first of Nisan, a certain family, the Arab Yehuda, did what? Brought wood to the temple. On the 20th of Tammuz, another family of priests and people brought wood to the te temple. On the 5th of Av, on the 7th of Av, on the 10th of Av, and now where I've underlined, on the 15th of the same month. By the way, you'll notice the concentration of days in Av. Apparently an Av was an optimal time to bring the wood. And there were families who either volunteered or had the, you know, here in our wonderful congregation, some people have a, uh, uh, you know, it's very, uh, they love to do p'ticha of the Aron. Others love to get a certain aliyah. So here there were families who wanted to bring wood to the temple. And this was their familial tradition and prerogative, apparently. And the Mishnah actually gives us names. By the way, where do these names come from? So we'll see it in the second. On the 15th of Av, so if you follow along with me now, page one where I've underlined in the middle there, in pa paragraph five, on the 15th of the same month, meaning of Av, our date, the family of Zatu of Yehuda, that's a family. By the way, just look for a second at the bottom of page one, a verse in Nehemiah refers to the, I'm on this page one still, on the very bottom, sons of Zatu. So in other words, the Mishnah is quoting families, and these families are discussed in the Bible. So back to the Mishnah. On the 15th of the same month, family of Zatu of Yudah, and with them, priests, Levites, and all those who were not certain of their tribe, and the families of Ugon Be'i Eli, and the families of Kotze Kitsio would bring the wood. So what do you see already from the Mishnah? You see that it's a big deal to bring wood. You see that families said, we bring wood on this day. We see that Av seems to be the best season to bring wood. And we see that of all the dates, the Mishnah lists nine different dates, but one of them, the Mishnah has a more elaborate description, and that's the 15th of Av. And on the 15th of Av, it's true that there's a family, but everybody who doesn't know their tribal association, which also might be a basis for the idea of tribal integration. Okay, so interesting stuff. And that seems to be on the 15th of Av. And notice, then the Mishnah goes into the fast days, and then the Mishnah goes into Tuba Av. So in other words, I'm saying the discussion of 15th of Av, when you see in the Mishnah, has already been quoted earlier in the Mishnah in the context of bringing wood. Okay? That's what we learned from the Mishnah. Now let's turn back, turn aside the page, but we're going to page 3. If you look in page 3, source 5, and I... I We'll just do this. Uh, let's do it again in the English. This is from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, excuse me. Nehemiah or Nehemiah. Um, Rabbi Einsiedler teaches on Fridays. Everybody's invited. He teaches these books. They're fascinating books. Ezra, Nehemiah, after Davnings. So everybody's invited. So that's every Friday morning here. So here from the book of Nehemiah on page 
3, source 5, there's a verse about casting lots among the priests, Levites, and people to bring wood offering to the house of God by clans annually at set times in order to provide fuel for the altar. In other words, what I'm trying to show here is that when the Mishnah talks about bringing wood for the altar, that's actually biblical already. It's in the book of Nehemiah, an idea of casting lots for who will bring wood to the altar. Now, let's just for a second elaborate what's going on in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the beginning of the building of the second temple. And when the people are rallying to build the second temple, they want to get the temple up and running. So they need provisions. So one of the things. You need wood for the altar to get the sacrifices going on the altar. If you're going to build a second temple, you need to make sure, right? There's like the treasurer who's making sure that we could keep the, you know, electricity going and the AC going. And more importantly, make sure that we have our our own and our light and our everything is and the Torah scrolls that we need. So that's what's going on. They're building the second temple and you need the firewood. And there is this process of making sure, and it's very interesting. I brought a note here in Hebrew. I'll just describe it outside. That normally the provisions maybe should come from a king. And here there maybe was a sponsor king out in Persia. But apparently there weren't enough provisions. So the people, the priests, the Levites, and the people gathered together, and they took it on themselves to consistently supply wood for the altar. So already in the Bible, we could sense that it's a sort of a big deal stepping up to the plate to make sure that we have the materials to have the second temple running constantly, consistently. That's in the Bible. And then now we remember what we saw in the Mishnah and the Mishnah talks about it records the families. It's a big deal. We preserve the tradition of the families. And maybe the 15th of Av is the best day, the most significant day, the catch-all day that continues, perpetuates this tradition of making sure year by year that there's adequate supplies for the altar to keep the fuel going, the fire going, the wood going. Now, if you turn the page, on page four, there's interesting things here in source seven, but there's a fair amount that I don't want to overwhelm. So let me just describe a little bit or maybe just read a little bit. Page four, source seven. This is from the Tosefta, which is parallel to the Mishnah, meaning it's an early source. We had the Bible, right? We saw from Vayikra, Leviticus, and Nehemiah from the Bible. Then we saw the Mishnah. And now we see in the parallel Tosefta, this is a, sort of the classical canonical works of rabbinic literature. And this is even pre-Talmudic. And the Tosefta describes, and I, this is by page four, paragraph five. I'll just read a little. Why did they set aside special times for the woods of priests and the people? For when the exiles came up, they found no wood in the chamber. They went and contributed wood of their own, hand it, hand it, handing it over to the public. And so the prophets stipulated that even if the cham chamber is loaded with wood, we'll remember the do-gooders, those who had voluntarism, those who were willing to contribute to make sure that the temple cult and the sacrifices got off the ground in the second temple period. So we record the families and we record the dates. And we can, especially, I would say, the 15th of Av, we'll see that in a second. And in the next Tosefta, which I skipped, it's very clear that this is a day of celebration. It's not just a day that we remember there was a good citizen, good civics lessons. We celebrate it. It's a day of celebration, and we'll see that more in a second. And then page four, door seven, paragraph seven, just says, interestingly, this is the bottom of page four, I'll just say it outside. They stay, tell a story here about how the Greeks tried to make it difficult to bring wood to, that's actually paragraph eight, to bring wood to the altar. 
So just like in the Bible, people made it difficult sometimes, but there's tragically it was Israelites or Jews. Here they say the Greeks. So maybe the Persians let the second temple period up, you know, launch the second temple period. But then after the Persians came the Greeks, right? That's the whole Hanukkah story. And according to this tradition, the Greeks tried to interfere with temple service, which we know, all right? Because eventually that's the whole Hanukkah story. So one of the ways they tried to interfere was said, they roadblocked. They said, you can't bring wood to the temple. And they found a workaround. They carried a ladder. It's a very wonderful passage. They carried ladders. They pretended they were going to do work. And then they dissembled the ladders and they found they used that as wood. So that's telling a bit of a legendary story of commitment to temple, sacrifice to temple, dedication to temple, even in difficult conditions. Even when there's a shortage of supply, even when there are enemies who are obstructing. And that is a time of dedication. So that explains, I think, a little bit, you know, some of the attitude or the context in page five. Turn to page five, please. In page five, source nine. Page five, source nine. You see here on the 15th of Av, is the time of bringing wood or the wood offering of the priests, and it is forbidden to have a eulogy on that day. Why is it forbidden to have a eulogy on the day? Because it's a happy day. Okay, this is in a list. This is called Megillat Tanit. Again, I don't want to overload with information, but Megillat Tanit is a list of Second Temple festive days, holidays, festivals. Some of them we've lost. They become obscure. The most famous the item on the list is Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah was a festive second temple period where we celebrate. We don't have eulogies. We don't have fasts. That's Hanukkah. But there were other days. And one of the days that was special during the second temple period, and here we have attestation and rabbinic source explicit, is not those nine different dates, but specifically the 15th of Av. Apparently, of all those dates, there were different dates special for families, but one day was special for everybody to mark the day of the wood, the day of bringing wood to the temple, which it probably had a certain practical dimension. Maybe there was a folk dimension to this also, that all, you know, we sort of don't have this in New York City, but farmers having, you know, their, you know, and outdoors and working with your hands and bringing the lumber Okay, so there's a sort of maybe a folksy part of this also, but it also, I think, signifies dedication to the temple during Second Temple times, even when times are difficult. What's quite fascinating, page 5, source 10, make sure you're with me for this one, page 5, source 10, is here we have corroborating evidence from Josephus. Pretty, almost perfect corroborating evidence. Josephus says, on the next day, page 5, source 10, which is the 14th of Av, which was the feast of wood carrying, on which it was a custom for everyone to bring chopped wood to the altar so that the fuel for the fire might never fail. And consistently, there should be fuel for the altar, for the fire of the altar. So here you have Josephus, right? Now we're not within just the Bible or the rabbis. I say just because as for us, the Bible's the most important, the rabbis are the most important, but still sometimes maybe we wonder, are these legends or other things? Josephus' task is history. And it doesn't mean he's always perfectly reliable, but here if you have something sort of corroborating, it makes sense, just a word, who's Josephus? Josephus is the great Jewish historian of antiquity who lived around the time of Jesus in the first century CE and actually lived towards the end when the temple was destroyed, the second temple. That's Josephus, so first century CE. And he tells us here in his work, and here it, there's no reason to doubt because he lived towards the end of the second temple. So he's probably telling us stuff that he knows firsthand. Doesn't make sense that he would talk about a wood offering festival and a firewood festival for the temple. Nobody's doing this. So apparently even in his lifetime, people are still celebrating this holiday. So maybe this is a very ancient holiday that's from Nehemiah with its roots beginning to make a big deal about collecting wood. 
But throughout the four or five hundred years of the Second Temple, they continue to mark this and it maybe it accrues and becomes a big deal. And maybe it really is among the happiest days because people feel a connection. We know hands on. Right. Um, this is like concrete being involved, dedicated, volunteerism, you know, giving. Um, an act of staka, participating in the temple, right? This isn't just about the priests. Everybody could be involved in a very hands-on way, which is sort of inspiring. Maybe we need to pick up that spirit of being involved in our temple hands-on. Okay, there's a lot there um, to think about. Now, one last source here, and it gets a little complicated, so I'm going to avoid the complexities, but just I can't skip it. It's on the bottom of page five, source 11. And that's a bunch of fascinating and not so simple Dead Sea Scroll texts. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you also have an idea of celebrating with wood. Dead Sea Scrolls are during the Second Temple times. They're usually dated to around second century BC, first century BC or so. So you're talking about in the middle of the Second Temple. And these are Jews who apparently separated themselves, went towards the Dead Sea. But a lot of what they cared about was the temple and how it should function. And they describe a series of holidays. You know, we have a hard enough time taking off work for the Jewish holidays. But if it was up to the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'd be missing like the entire three months from Shavuos through Sukkot in holidays. So I'm not sure you'd be employed. You might need to join the sectarians in the Dead Sea. Um, but they had a lot of holidays. And if you see here the list, page 5, source 11, they had in addition, of course, to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuos, they had other holidays. Annual ordination of priests, the new wine holiday, the new oil holiday, and a wood offering holiday. It wasn't one day for them. It was six days, and it was somewhat later. It was somewhat later. Okay? So here you have other sources in Second Temple time that the wood for the temple is a big deal. Okay? It's not just so maybe it just shows us the things that we sort of don't appreciate. They're a big deal, or maybe there's in them that to be um, participate in that, keeping the flame, uh, the ner to me, the flame or the flame of the altar going is a very big deal. Now, I want to, so that's, so let's just summarize where we're at. And I want to just go a few more minutes, only a few, like five, seven more minutes. I want to just get back to the Babylonian Talmud. But where we're at is what is the 15th of Av all about? So we know a little, uh, the day of love and Sadie Hawkins day, and maybe the story in the book of Judges with the tribe of Benjamin. And then we see the Mishnah, and we see different things in the Mishnah about the vineyards and about dancing, etc. And then we see the Talmud, and Talmud gives Jerusalem Talmud five explanations, Babylonian Talmud six explanations. And again, just briefly, I want to review the explanations because they're important. I want us to think about them. So we saw, I'll, I'll conclude with what we were talking about, but we saw the tribes intermarrying, or the Benjamin intermarrying, or the generation of the desert, no longer, no more death, and now we can focus on life. Or we saw that may, enabling the northern kingdom people to uh, return to Jerusalem. And uh, we saw the burial of those who were killed in Betar in the Bar Kokhba revolt. And then we had what's the sixth explanation in the Babylonian Talmud, but the first in the Jerusalem Talmud, it's the wood. And at first we see that and we're almost going to skip it because we have no connection with the wood, the temple. But then you go back and you start say, seeing the story of the wood is actually a thick story and an interesting story of both history and, I think, symbolism. And it's a story of not just in the Mishnah, it's in the Chemia. It's the beginnings of building the Second Temple and making sure there's an adequate wood supply and a consistency and launching this temple. And maybe even an illusion that Tosefta that later empires try to interfere and they overcame and all the way through josephus saying that i think in his lifetime people celebrate this he says the 14th of av but no doubt that could be the night into the 15th 15th of av and the rabbi seemed to single out the 15th of av as a day of celebration so it has 
a uh, sort of grassroots dimension, but it really might have become more festive. Maybe it did turn into a day of dancing and being out in the fields and celebrating and also showing your commitment um, to the temple. But I want to get back just in conclusion to what's going on in the Talmuds when they start giving multiple explanations. And I sort of hinted at some of the sources of some of the multiple explanations. But I wonder whether we could take all these explanations and sort of see an underlying theme to them. And I think we see a, a little of a, a beginnings of that in some of the way I described it. I described the wood as a way of signifying your dedication to the temple. And perhaps there's a larger story here. There's a very fascinating source here that's worth reading on page six, but it'll take too much time. I'll just describe it outside a little bit. It's a bit of a harrowing midrash. And it's actually focused on another one of those explanations about the end of the death of that generation. And it describes how year after year, how miserable Tisha B'av was in the desert. Because according to tradition, the sin of the spies happened on Tisha B'av, right? The Mishnah actually on page one, I'll just say it outside, says, why do we fast Tisha B'av? And the Mishnah says destruction of the first temple, destruction of the second temple, the sin of the spies. <laughs> then it talks about the plowing of the city of Jerusalem. And then it talks about the catastrophe at Betar. That's what the Mishnah says. I'm sorry, I said it fast. Why do we fast Tisha B'Av? I'm sorry, I just needed to have this as background. Why do we fast Tisha B'Av? Destruction of two temples, sin of the spies, the plowing of Jerusalem, destruction of Jerusalem, and even continuation into Bar Kokhba, a great defeat at Betar. That's why we fast Tisha B'Av. Now back to this Midrash. The Midrash says, that every year in the desert, Tisha B'Av was the worst day because that was the day of the sin of the spies. And in fact, in the Midrashic, let's call it imagination, every year, a certain percentage of the population would die on Tisha B'Av. It was really dark, Tisha B'Av. Whether that's literal or sort of just capturing the, the, the uh, tragedy in a very gripping way, every year they die. And the Midrash describes year 40, and says in year 40, they sort of lost count. The people didn't even know what year they are. They're in the desert. And it's Tisha B'Av, that much they know. They know the day, they don't know the year. Or they think it's Tisha B'Av, and they're expecting that terrible death. And lo and behold, nobody dies. And then they say, well, maybe we got the day wrong. Maybe tomorrow's Tisha B'Av. And lo and behold, nobody dies. And they say, maybe the next day is Tisha B'Av. And they say, no, behold, nobody dies. And then this continues on until the 15th of Av, according to the Midrash on page 6. Why the 15th of Av? Because of the full moon. When they see the full moon, they know it's no longer Tisha B'Av. They know Tisha B'Av is pre the full moon. And at that point, they're certain that the full moon, that illumination, they're done with the darkness of Tisha B'Av. And of course, Tubab is on the seventh day, beginning in Tisha B'av. It's the end of the Shiva of Tisha B'av. It's the standing up from the Shiva, from the shadow of Tisha B'av. Year after year, but no doubt, onto our own times. We're in the darkest part of the Jewish calendar. And part of Jewish tradition says you have to sit in the dark times too, because that is life. And that is certainly Jewish history. So we commemorate and we mourn and we suffer along with the tragedies of Jewish history. But then we emerge. We emerge from the Shiva. We emerge from the darkness when we see that full moon on the 15th. And I would posit that all the explanations of the Talmud are reversals of Tisha B'Av, are the opposites of Tisha B'Av. If Tisha B'Av began with the death, 
with the spies, with the sin of the spies. Tubab is the end of the death of the sin of the spies. We're done with that curse. If the last explanation of the Mishnah, Tishabab is the tragedy of Betar, then Tubab is the Nechama of Betar, the burial, the dignity, moving on from the tragedy of Betar. And I would suggest all of the explanations in some form link up with this. If Tishabab is about destruction of temple, then the bringing of the wood is about building temple. And even under difficult circumstances, commitment, dedication, finding ways to build temple. And we hold on to that memory and we hold on to that belief of building in the wake of destruction. And if Tishabab, according to the rabbis, is about hatred, dinat chinam, inner hatred, then Tubab is about love, is about ahavat chinam. It's the holiday of love where we don't worry so much about the enemies, we worry about one another. Are there barriers within us, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, one tribe against another tribe, Benjamin and us in civil war? That's the story of Tishabav. And Tubav is rising above it. If Tishabav is about baseless hatred, Tubav is about free baseless love, love among one another. So a lot to aspire to. When we go through the darkness, we have the illumination, the full moon, and the challenge, but also the optimism of a holiday of love among one another and hope for a future temple to be rebuilt speedily. If anybody has any questions or comments, yeah, Alan. So everybody likes their half again. <laughs> so basically, you, well, you can't spoil that ending. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but think that others have followed three. Yeah. Interesting. I do think, I would say it in a softer way. I do think that there's some sense that anthropologically you could find certain uh, parallels. That's what I was alluding to. The grape harvest, and maybe even the wood and other things. So I wouldn't call it pagan. I would say there's a folk dimension to it. There might be some parallels. <laughs> oh, I like it. That's interesting. <laughs> Alan, a lot of sharp comments. I still stick with my the thesis, but they're sharp comments. I hear. I hear. On this Monday, about the rich guys. Right. And no, but that's consistent with what I'm saying. Yeah, and everybody. I think you're right. Everybody participated. And everybody could collect some trees. Right. That's right. Yeah. One, maybe one or two uh, more comments, and then anybody wants to ask me afterwards. I just see the hours late. Yeah. I so appreciated the issue. I learned so much. Thank you. And I appreciate what you said about the reversal of Tishabah. Yeah. Perhaps the theme that you mentioned is all the elements, even in bringing the wood to maintain the temple, of course, the antidote to this discussion, the opposite, because the sources mention how these were practices carried among family. And I will make that time is also how people, when they're uh, treated with dignity, they're those who fell, their family members, it's all about relationships. It's all about even those who are with us. Yeah, and nice. And through time, through the generation. Nice. Okay. Yeah, Interesting comments. Family doing, and relationships and all that. It's not, yeah. uh, uh, as, as it says, you know, after it's not over when one of those people 
go into the other world. That brother, that link right, even will always that. remain. That's nice. And this is a nice uh, suggestion. Nice. Um, okay, I think the hour is late. I'm going to stop, but I'll stick around if anybody has comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was just saying in this legend that they knew by the full moon, they knew. But I think 